Okay, it looks like it's around time for us to get started. Um, your tests are almost ready. The TA gave them back to me this morning, so all the grading's been done. So the last thing I have to do is just kind of look them over and get the grades entered. Certainly I'll be ready to give them back to you by Wednesday. Um, when you see your grade go up in bright space, that's when you know it's time you can have them back. Um, when you see your grade posted, feel free to drop by my office and pick it up. Otherwise, I'll probably bring them to class or the labs or whatever just to get them back to you as soon as I can. Um, because I guess you'll want that feedback before the next test. So, if the grades aren't up today, they should be up kind of tomorrow morning. So, they're coming soon. Any questions before we get started today? No? Okay, so let's get going. Um, last day we talked about electric potential. We related it to electric field. We sort of did a lot of work with that stuff. We're going to pick up with some examples today. And then we should have time to get some fun stuff in. So I tried to pick a selection of the classic kind of examples that you might see you would be expected to be able to do. So let's start with our capacitor example. That's kind of a thread that goes throughout the whole course. A capacitor has two centimeter square let plates. Um, that means each side has length of two centimeters. They have equal and opposite charges of 3.75 microcoulombs. Oh, that was a typo, sorry. That should be nanocoulombs. nanocoulombs. The plates are separated by a distance of 0 0.1 millimeters. Usually we call that distance D. Um, parts A and B is just some stuff about the capacitor itself, find the charge density and the electric field. So let's do A and B first. Charge density is, sigma, is the total charge divided by the area of each plate, so Q over L squared. 3.75 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs divided by 0 0.02 meters squared gives us a charge density of 9.375 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs per meter squared. Okay, so there's our charge density on each plate. Part B says find the electric field. We know the electric field is related to the density, so we'll use that expression to find the field. Our electric field has a magnitude of sigma over epsilon naught which is 3.75 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. Oh, sorry, what am I doing? 9.375 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs per meter squared, divided by epsilon naught, coulombs squared over newtons meters squared, to give us a magnitude of our electric field, um, 1.06 times 10 to the 6 newtons per coulomb. Electric field is a vector, so we do have to specify the direction. In terms of our picture, it points to the left. So we could say that the vector is the electric field in the negative i direction. Or if you said from positive to negative, that's OK too. But you would have to specify the direction in some way that's meaningful. Okay, there's A and B. We've done that sort of stuff before, so that's more of a review. Any questions there? Okay, so now we'll layer in the new bits. So these arrows in the picture are the electric field arrows. The next part of the setup says a proton moves along the path shown with a constant speed. So we've got a proton. It starts down here. You know protons are positive. It's going to move from here up to here along that path delta r. Part C says find the change in potential difference or electric potential difference as the proton moves along this path. So here's where we'll relate the electric potential to the electric field the way we did last day. So part C, change in electric potential is negative of the scalar product between the electric field and the path taken by the charged particle. Two ways to find a dot product. You can do magnitude of E times magnitude of delta R times the angle between them. Um, we don't really have that information. So let's go with the other way, the component method. 
So that would be negative dx delta x plus dy delta y plus ez delta z. This method is a little bit more appealing, a little bit more doable, because if we were going to use the first method, we have to know this angle, and we don't have any information to give us this angle. If we look at this part, EZ times delta Z, there's no Z component of the electric field, so that whole bit is gone. If we look at this bit, delta Y is not zero because it does move upwards, but the Y component of electric field is zero. So it doesn't matter what delta Y is, because there's no Y component of the field. So that bit is also zero. So our equation has simplified fairly nicely for us. We've got minus dx times delta x. So I've got minus, my x component of electric field is minus 1.06 times 10 to the 6 newtons per coulomb. My delta x is my distance traveled in the x direction. Our picture shows that it goes the whole distance across. So delta x is 0 0.1 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. And that gives us a change in potential, delta V equals positive 106 volts. Now that we've got our answer, let's take stock. Delta V is positive. It means we've moved towards bigger potential from a low potential to a high potential. If we look at our electric field vectors, we know electric field points from a positive plate to a negative plate. Electric fields also point from areas of high potential to low potential. Okay, so that's also something we know about fields. We moved ultimately to the right. We did move to an area of high potential. So we got a positive for our change in potential. So that makes sense. Okay, so that's the result. Had we moved the other way, we would have expected a negative for our delta V because we would have moved towards lower potential. Good so far? All right. Part D, find the change in electric potential energy as our proton moves. Here's where we remember delta U, change in electric potential energy, is the charge that's moving around in the potential times the change in potential through which it moves. So that's plus E times delta V plus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs times 106 volts gives us 1.69 times 10 to the minus 17 joules. So the electric potential energy increases because we've taken our positive charge and we've pushed it towards the positive plate. We put it into an area with more potential energy. Part E, find the work done. We know that the work done is negative of the change of electric potential energy, so negative 1.69 times 10 to the minus 17. Okay, any questions? Question, yes. Yep. Uh, can we circle back to the, uh, what is it? the part C with the Y component being zero? Yep. I'm just not understanding why it's zero exactly. So our electric field only points to the left. It doesn't point up or down at all. Since it doesn't point up or down, there is no Y component. The Y part is zero. Okay. Yeah, great. Definitely good to get all those bits sorted out. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so that's one type of question we can talk about. So that's finding our change in potential from our electric field. We also talked about last day, if we had our electric potential, we could find the electric field from doing the derivative. So potential was the integral of field, means field is the derivative of potential. So that's the next example we're going to do. This one is pretty artificial, mostly because it's hard to get meaningful variable electric potentials. Um, so we'll go with this slightly artificial one just to get the idea of the method. So in a region of space, we have an expression for our electric potential that depends on x, y, and z. So our electric potential is variable in space. 
We'd like to find the electric potential at x, y, and z all equals one. So this bit is gonna be easy. We know x, y, and z, we know our equation. Let's find our electric potential. So five times x cubed minus two times y plus z cubed, z squared, sorry. That gives us four volts. So at this spot in space, x, y, and z equals one, the electric potential is equal to four volts. Part B, find an expression for the electric field. So expression means find an equation for the electric field. When we're doing this part, we have to be really careful to remember that we know electric field is a vector, so our answer for part B definitely has to be a vector. We're expecting to have i, j, and k in our answer because it's a vector. Part B. So our relationship between the field and the potential is that the component of the electric field is the derivative of the potential. So the x component of electric field is negative, the derivative of the potential with respect to x. And this is our form for partial derivatives. And the partial derivative means we treat x as the variable. Everything else is constant. So there's our partial derivative again, because the x component tells us about the variation in the x direction. Okay, so this is all x stuff. So this is minus the derivative with respect to x, 5x cubed minus 2y plus z squared. This is the kind of derivative I more or less think you can do in your head. Okay. So the power law derivatives, you don't have to write out a big chunk of workings for that because I just think you know how to do that. That's something I expect you're doing with. So the derivative of 5x cubed is 3 times 5 gives us 15 times x. That power goes down by 1. And then don't forget our negative sign. The derivative of 2y is going to be 0 because we're taking y as a constant. So these things are constants when we do our partial derivatives with respect to x. The derivative of z squared is also 0, so the x component of the electric field is minus 15 times x squared. Okay, let's do the y and the z. So the y component of the electric field is the negative of the change in potential with respect to y. So this time the x is treated as constant, so the derivative of 5x cubed is 0. The derivative of negative 2y is negative 2. Don't forget to multiply by your negative sign to get plus 2. And the derivative of z squared is equal to 0. Then we do the derivative with respect to z. Likewise, again, the derivative with respect to z. So the derivative of 5x cubed with respect to z is 0, with respect to y is 0. The derivative of 2z squared is 2 times z. And we've got to include our negative, so we get minus 2 times. So you find each of your components of the electric field. Then to clue up and write down your answer, you have to write it as a vector. Our electric field vector is the x component in the x direction, plus the y component in the y direction, plus the z component in the z direction. Yep? Will we have to write down that we're doing each derivative separately, or can we do derivative x, y, z? we know that we're just going to get each. So are you kind of asking if you can leave out this step? No, I was asking if you could just say, instead of going with derivative with respect to x and respect to y and respect to z, we know that we're going to do each of the derivatives separately, should yeah. each one be equal to zero. If we just go from step uh, one all the way to step four, by stating, because we, we know that it's So you're saying to leave out these two steps? Yeah. No, you can't leave those out. You get a show those. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I trust that you know how to do it, but you still have to show that amount of detail. Okay. Yeah. Okay, there's part B done. Part C, find the electric field at x, y, and z equals 1. So to find our electric field, we'll just put in our values. 
So the electric field at 1, 1, and 1 is minus 15 times 1 squared plus 2. Notice there is no y value, so 2 is just hanging out by itself. Minus 2 times z, that was 1. So our electric field at that point is minus 15 in the i direction plus 2 in the j direction minus 2 in the z direction and the units are newtons per coulomb. Okay, so one of the big deals here is that your potential is a scalar and your electric field is a vector. Okay, questions? Still good? Okay. So let's move on to the next little bit. Let's talk about the potentials around conductors. So when we did electric fields, we focused on electric fields of conductors for a bit. Now we'll look at the electric potential of a conductor. I've got a conductor with a completely kind of random shape. I just drew a blob in PowerPoint. Um, I'm going to ask, what is the potential of a conductor in electrostatic equilibrium? And, you know, it's not said, but it is implied, a charged conductor. Okay, so it carries some amount of charge. And what is the electric potential inside the conductor? So we did this for electric fields. Um, as a reminder for our electric fields, the electric field was zero inside. And the electric field was sigma over epsilon naught perpendicular just outside. So that's a summary of what we found when we did the stuff with electric fields. Now let's start to think about electric potential, because potential and field are not the same thing. They're related, but they're not the same. So let's think about what's happening inside the conductor first. We know our expression for electric potential is delta V is minus the integral of E dot dx. So that's our general expression for calculating a change in potential. S refers to some path that we take. If we're inside, then we're just going to draw some path inside. Doesn't really matter what the path is, but it does have to be entirely inside. So here's our initial point, here's our final point, and this is our path x. ds refers to a little tiny bit of the path. So let's show a little tiny bit of the path. So here's a small segment of our path ds. So this is the setup of the integral to find our electric field or to find our electric potential. Let's now remember the fact that our electric field is equal to zero. So the integral of zero dot ds is just zero. So the integral of zero is just zero. So what this tells us is that there is no change in electric potential inside. If there's no change, it means the potential is constant. Okay, and an important point to wrap your head around, just because your delta V is zero, doesn't make V zero. The potential could be a thousand volts, 10,000 volts, or a million volts. The thing that's important is that it doesn't change, right? The delta is zero. Okay, so that's inside. Let's also look at outside. So for outside, we'll use the same relationship. Delta V is minus the integral of E dot 
Yes. X refers to our path, so I'm going to draw another little bit of the path. Let's say I start here and I take my path. And by outside, I mean on the surface. I think on the surface is probably a little bit more descriptive of what we're doing here. So on the surface, our path goes from some initial point to some final point. This is our path S. We should identify some little point DS. So DS is just a little small part of the path. And let's see what this tells us. So delta V is minus the integral of E dot DS. E is our electric field just outside the surface. The electric field is perpendicular to the surface. That's what we found in one of our properties of the conductor. We're finding our electric potential on the surface. So our path was along the surface. Another way to say along the surface is parallel to the surface. Um, so one's perpendicular, one's parallel. These are perpendicular vectors. So this is minus the integral of E times DS times cosine of 90 degrees. So delta V along the surface is also zero, which means that V is constant everywhere on the surface. So if we have a charged conductor in electrostatic equilibrium, so it has some excess charge, it's in equilibrium, this tells us that the entire conductor is at the same potential, okay? or we can say that the entire conductor is at an equipotential. So entire conductor So if you have a conductor, and if you know the potential at some point, you know the potential at every point. So the entire thing has to be at the same potential. Um, and that makes sense because if the potential wasn't the same, there must be an electric field. If there's an electric field, the charges would move around. The charges don't move around, so the potential has to be the same. Okay, are we good to here? Okay, so let's take this and let's apply it to a spherical conductor and see what we get. So we did this with our electric field chapter. Um, we'll do it now with our potential. With electric fields, we asked what is the electric field inside and outside of spherical conductor, and we used Gauss's law to answer those questions. We're gonna ask what is the potential inside and outside of spherical conductor, and we're gonna use the relationship between field and potential to get our answer. So that's where we're going with this. And once we get it figured out, we'll draw a graph of the potential. So let's start by trying to figure out what is the electric potential outside the conductor? So what is V for R greater than R or outside? In our picture, the radius of our conductor is capital R. 
We want to start by finding the potential outside. So right here. So at some point R. So let's start by writing down our relationship between potential and field. So delta V equals minus the integral of E dot delta S or E dot DS, sorry. So let's remember what we know here. Our electric field is radial. That is the only component of electric field we have. Electric field from a charged conductor points straight out everywhere. So it's only the radial component of the electric field that matters. So we could write this as E times DS. Okay, so it only depends on the distance from the center. We know that our expression for the electric field outside of a spherical conductor is K times the charge on the conductor divided by the distance to it. Okay, so I'm using the result we know about the electric field to plug that in. Um, I can take my constants outside. K is Coulomb's constant, S out front that the integral of 1 over r squared dr. The integral of 1 over r squared, this is one of those integrals that I expect you to know. It's just kind of like the inverse of the power law. So the integral of 1 over r squared is minus 1 over r. Or plus k. So my potential outside is kq over r. And this assumes we use the reference point that v, as we get very far away from the sphere, is equal to zero. Okay, so that's that standard reference point that we always use. So this is probably not a surprising result. If we're outside of a charge conducting sphere, the potential looks like the potential of a um, point charge. Okay, so once we're outside, it doesn't know the difference between a solid sphere and a point charge. So that's outside. Next, we'd like to do what is the potential on the surface? So what about at R equals So for this one, the distance from the center is just the radius of the sphere up. So there's our potential on the surface. We know the distance from the center. And then inside, this is where we have to go a little bit conceptual. So what about some point here? So V of R less than R, or inside. Here's where we remember that the entire conductor has to be at the same potential. So the value everywhere inside is the same as the value at the surface. Okay, any questions to here? Yep. Uh, why the positive inside the conductor cannot be zero? Why isn't it zero? Because it has to be the same everywhere. It can't change. If I had a different potential inside than I did at the surface, if the potential changes, it means we have an electric field. If we have a field, we have a force. If we have a force, we have an acceleration. Acceleration means the charges are moving, but these charges aren't moving. Right? So the field has to be zero, which means the potential has to be constant. And we found it was equal to this value. Okay, so the next bit says to graph the potential. So I've got my axes drawn here. 
Let's make a graph of those potentials. So the interesting bit is going to be at r equal to r. So everywhere inside, we said that the potential was kq over r. That's true right up to the center, right up to the surface. So this is for the inside. Potential is constant. And it has a value of k times q divided by the radius of the sphere. Once we get outside, it falls off as 1 over r. And eventually, as r gets very, very big, that potential will go to 0. That would be linear, wouldn't it? That would be what? No, if you did a plot of 1 over r, you would see that it's a curve. Yeah. Linear would be v is proportional to negative r. That would be a downward straight line. Um, and then if we wanted a reminder, because I think this could be useful, what did our electric field look like as a function of distance? When we did our electric field, it was 0 inside everywhere. Our maximum value was k times q over r squared. That's right here. And then that fell off as 1 over r squared, which is a factor decrease. So just sort of something to catch here. I've said it a couple of times, but it is still pretty important. Just because your electric field is 0 doesn't mean your potential is 0. It means your potential is constant because right, your potential tells you about changes. Okay, questions? No? Okay, so we're good to hear. Oh, my phone call just Yep. Yeah. Is there ever an instance where uh, if we have like a weak conductor, the charge could break out? Yes, and we're going to talk about that specifically when we talk about circuits. Then you will have fields inside conductors and changing potentials. Okay. Yeah, for sure that happens. In fact, we're going to show, see a demo of it right now. Okay, so let's do an example of a Van de Graaff generator. And the numerical example we're going to do is how much charge is on the surface if the thing gets charged up to 50,000 volts. So let's see this in operation. See some of the stuff we're talking about. It's not going to get very dark, but I am going to turn the lights off. I can figure out which switch is which. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn it on and I'm going to get it going. And the way this thing works is that inside the generator, there's a little belt. This belt goes around and around and around. It grabs the electrons off the air, which transfers a charge to this sphere on the top. Um, we had to do a makeshift band out of a pair of pantyhose. So maybe it'll last, maybe it won't, we'll give it a shot. And as that's getting charged, this one is staying at ground. So what we're seeing, I think you can probably hear it, can blow it the screen too. So can you see the little spark that happens? Okay, this is kind of cool. So the big sphere is getting charged. The little charge, the little sphere is staying at ground. So there's a potential difference between the two things. Um, if there's a potential difference, there's an electric field. Typically, air is an insulator. Electricity doesn't travel through it. But if you can get the electric field high enough, about 3, 000, 3 million volts per meter, air will go into what we call a dielectric breakdown and it becomes conducting and the spark will jump. Um, and this, this is just lightning. Okay, so same deal. Okay, so that's cool. Turn this down. Um, and usually that's going to come back on. Yeah, so it'll come back up. 
So that's the one thing we can do with the Van de Graaff. It shows sort of what happens with the electric field. We can make the spark when it starts to travel. The other fun thing is when we put the hands on the ball. Um, I guess most people have sort of seen some of that. Does anybody want to be part of the demo? Sure. Yeah, okay. Um, a little bit of hair is going to make the best demo. I don't have a whole lot of it. We still give it a try. We give it a try with short hair. Yeah. Okay, so you two can duke it out. Who wants to be the one that comes up? Uh, is that functioning as uh, like electromagnetism when it releases that charge? It's all static electricity. Because it, I was wondering, is it working like it's basically similar to like an EMP, the way that it, it shorts out the, because it's a quick burst of energy. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's creating enough of a magnetic field to. Yeah, it interferes with that one. Um, yes, that is what happens. So do you have your phone in your pocket? Yeah. Probably put your phone up here. Just because. Just because. There is going to be a little potential. So stand on the stool. <laughs> stand on the stool. One hand on the ball. Don't let go until I tell you to. Um, I make prom five-year-olds promise me. Do you promise you won't let go? I promise. You promise. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to turn it on. I do this on kids all the time. Five and up, four and up. I do it on my own children. This is a safe thing. But don't let go until I tell you to, because you could get a spark. Oh, you don't have a lot of hair. Let's see what happens, though. We might have to give a second volunteer. Can you feel it tingle? No. No, not yet. So I don't think I can turn it up any higher. So we'll just wait a bit. Um, even if you don't have tons of hair to make a great demo, most people have some hair on your arm. You can feel the hair on your arm start to stand up. Maybe. Maybe a little bit. I think. Okay, and then it'll probably start to tingle a little bit. As it goes and goes, you might start to see it on my hair because the feel will start to spread. Mm -hmm. It looks like maybe your hair is standing up in the back. Yeah. Maybe, although that could be the hair itself. Um, so what happens, the overall view of what happens is our big ball is getting charged. Um, all of the electrons are transferring off the ball into your hand, going through your body. You are getting all charged up so that you're at the same potential at the sphere. So you and the sphere is all one big potential. This is why I've got you on the stool, because your feet are grounded. The charge can't travel out of you to the ground. Does it feel weird yet? A, bit. a little bit weird. So you're getting all charged up. If you had long hair, it would be all poofed out. Okay, I'm gonna get you to come down. Don't let go. Thank you. So now just take your hand and rub it on the desk. That's just to discharge yourself. That's it. <laughs> okay, would anybody else like to come up and try? No? No. Yes, okay, come on. It's totally fine. <laughs> I don't care if we spend the rest of the class doing this. It's all good. You have too much <laughs> no, you don't have too much. Just the right amount. Okay, so phone on the table, one hand on the ball. Okay. And do you promise not to let go till I say? Yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, are you okay with being on the video? I'll turn it away if you're not. Oh, if you let go, um, you are charged. You'll get a spark cap, and just like you can stuff your feet across part of the country, you want to help. There's not a hurry, oh my goodness. I said I do this on five year olds. You feel anything? Oh my hand. Okay, so give your hair just a little bit of a shake. Oh, oh, we definitely got something. Some of the curls are starting to lift. So we'll keep charging. Shake your hair out again. You see it starting to go up? <laughs> yeah, it was totally going. Uh, the band is not as good as the rubber belt we used to use, but we can't get those anymore. Um, so we're kind of make shifting. But the one in my hand is skinny. Yeah, you feel it on your hands? Yeah, those little hairs will go up first because they tend to be so small, right? Okay, let's do another shake. Oh, yeah, 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 it's really starting to go. Oh, you can probably see yourself in this too. Yeah. The nylon collects the charge, and there's a grating inside that helps transfer the charge inside. Let's give it one more shake. 
Okay, yours is pretty good. It lifted up pretty high. Okay, see, so oh, I heard it snap off you. So take your hand, just give a rub on the desk. Okay, you're good. Okay, anybody else? No, okay, so we'll call this done for today. Thank you to my volunteers. Um, way more boring if you guys don't help out. So when I charge that up, a typical amount of charge that goes on these Van de Graaffs is about 50,000 volts. Um, another thing that's sort of interesting is this sort of static electricity charge. This is not the stuff that kills you, right? If you stick your hand into a wall, um, what's the wall at, 112? I can't remember right off the top of my head. Um, that kind of voltage difference, that kind of potential, that's the one that kills you with the AC current. This stuff will just give you a little bit of shock. Um, so that's why this is safe to do. So um, I think we talked about everything I wanted to mention. So let's do our calculation. So how much charge is on the surface? We know that the potential is 50,000 volts. We know that the radius is 20 centimeters, 0 0.2 meters. And we want to find the charge. We know V is K times Q over R. Q is equal to V times R over K, 50,000 volts times K times R, times R divided by K. So the net charge on that sphere is 1.11 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. So we often talk about how a coulomb is big, right? So here's a micro coulomb spread over the sphere of that disk that kind of does a lot of demonstrable stuff. Okay, any questions? Yep? Can you kind of mention how on the wall you have like a, would that be kilovolts or just volts, 112? Yeah. Uh, no, it's just like 100. 110 volts comes out of the wall. Oh, okay. 120. 120. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 120 out of the wall. Um, that kind of voltage, that kind of current, the alternating current that switches back and forth, that's the stuff that kills you because. <laughs> do not stick anything in bolt in outlets on walls. <laughs> nothing, nothing whatsoever, ever. Uh, this this is not an experiment to do at home. Yeah, no, trust me, <laughs> nothing in, vault, in outlets and walls, not ever. So this doesn't kill you because it's uh, direct Because it's direct current um, and because you're not getting that changing voltage, right? This doesn't produce a big current going through your body, not the way the AC stuff does. Isn't that what they did with the, uh, they used the puppies as a demonstration? Of puppies? There, there was puppies and elephants, they used as a demonstration of why you should use uh, direct current rather than alternating current. Yeah. That was the whole reason we didn't use alternating current. It was like Tesla was using direct current for the longest time with Nikola Tesla. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they used puppies as a, and Elvis as a demonstration by charging them with alternating current and like in giant crowds of circuses to kill the puppies and the elephants to show how dangerous. So in general, Tesla, Tesla was right and killing puppies are bad if we're looking for life lessons here. Yeah. Okay, so now we're getting way off track. Let's try and bring it back a bit. Um, so when we talked about properties of conductors and electrostatic equilibrium, we went through the first three in our electric field chapter, our Gauss's Law. Now we're coming back to the fourth property, which says that the charge density, that sigma, is biggest where the curve is steepest. And then if you take that thought a step further, we know that electric field depends on the charge density. So if density is big, the field is big. So that's where we're gonna go on this slide. Um, first, let's make sure we can put some math together with the words. If the curve is steeper, if you have a rounded object, if you have a smaller radius, you will have a steeper curve. Okay, so this one has a steeper curve than this one. So here's our sphere one, it's got charge one, it's got radius one. Here's our sphere two, it's got charge two, it's got radius two. We've connected them by a thin wire, um, thin wire made out of a conductor, it's a thin conducting wire. This one has our steep curve. 
and comparatively this one has our shallow curve. Oh, that's lovely. Um, so the thing we know about conductors is that they all have to be at exactly the same potential. Okay, so that's something we've already shown. So we're going to start with the, the premise that the potential of one is equal to the potential of two because everything is conducting and it's all touching and an entire conductor is all at the same potential. The potential on the surface of one is K times Q1 divided by R1. The potential on the surface of two is K times Q2 over R2. Um, we've got Q on both, K on both sides, so those cancel. What we can do about our Q because we want to incorporate our density, is we know that sigma one, charge density on sphere one, is charge one divided by area one, which is charge one divided by four times pi times r one squared. So q one is sigma one times four pi r one squared. And then likewise on our sphere two, That's sigma 2 times 4 pi r2 squared. Okay, so my goodness, that went crazy, didn't it? Okay. Let's fill those things in for our q1 and q2. Sigma 1, 4 pi r1 squared divided by r1 is sigma 2, 4 pi r2 squared divided by r2. We can simplify, we've got four pi on both sides, we've got R1 squared on top, R1 on the bottom, likewise on this side. So sigma one R1 equals sigma two R2. Sigma one is equal to sigma two times R2 divided by R1. Okay, so this is an expression that relates the two charge densities. R2 divided by R1 R1 is less than R2, so R2 over R1 is bigger than 1, okay? just because R2 is bigger than R1. So our conclusion is that sigma 1 is bigger than sigma 2. So we have proven that final property, that the charge density is the greatest. And then our next conclusion is that the electric field is sigma over epsilon naught outwards. So what that tells us is that a steep object means a big field. Okay, so something that's very steep has a big electric field. Um, another way we could describe something that is really steep, um, a word I might use is pointy. Okay, so something pointy has a big electric field. And I think I have just enough time to show you a video of why that can matter and the application we can use. And that application, if this thing will come up, is lightning rods. Um, anybody have a lightning rod in their house? I'm thinking probably not here in Newfoundland. People who lived in Ontario probably did. So this is a video of lightning hitting the CN Tower. And it's kind of cool, like the lightning hit the CN Tower like 40 times in a row in this storm. So kind of colloquially, people say, oh, lightning never strikes twice. And that's patently untrue. Lightning hits the same thing a lot of times. So our, just go back to the beginning. So something that's very pointy has a high electric field. Lightning is electricity, we saw that here. So the lightning is attracted to that pointy object um, and this is why you shouldn't have an umbrella outside in a thunderstorm. If you're outside in thunder and lightning, you don't want to be the tall pointy object that the lightning is drawn to, right? Leave that to the trees or something else taller. Okay, we'll quit there for today and we'll be back on Wednesday and I'll have your test ready for you then. Um, today is my day that I'm running to my next class so I don't have time for questions, but... Um